learned something tonight. I've learned that I am two years younger than my birth certificate says. <laughs> <laughs> and I recall in one lecture, I think it was in Harvard, when I was introduced as being interested in amateur bird watching. The first question I got was, what is an amateur bird? <laughs> But it is a great honor for me to be invited this evening to deliver the Butler Lecture. In fact, uh, as a historical accident, I was in Cambridge at the time when Ralph Butler was a Master of Trinity College. It's also an immense privilege to be at this school in particular, because you have a history of very distinguished mathematicians, including Wallace, who gave us the infinity symbol and the famous Wallace formula, to say nothing of Isaac Barrow, who was Isaac Newton's teacher. So I feel I'm on mathematically sacred ground, at least, <laughs> when I come to your school. And let me say to the teachers how proud you ought to be of the quality of your students. I had a Socratic dialogue with a number of them this afternoon, and we got almost 100% participation. And the questions were, to me, very impressive. So you have every reason to be proud of what you're doing for the minds of the young people of England today. And I was massively encouraged, too, to hear of your headmaster's interest in developing the whole person and in teaching young people to think. Now, all of that does not belong to the 40 minutes of my lecture. <laughs> The topic that we are to address tonight is, has science buried God? And it is a very popular impression that people have that if we're going to be intellectually respectable in the 21st century, we've got really to make a choice. We've got to choose uh, either to be scientists or to stick with God. We certainly cannot keep both God and science. Now that's a very odd situation, because if you look back historically, the great pioneers of science, Kepler, Galileo, and the aforementioned Isaac Newton, were all believers in God. And I want to address, at least in part, the question of what has happened to change the situation. Why is it that Stephen Hawking, for instance, tells us that we must choose between science and God? Now, at a trivial level, it ought to be pretty clear that science has not buried God. The Scots among you will have rejoiced with the rest of us when Peter Higgs won the Nobel Prize this year for physics, or last year. Brilliant, his prediction of the Higgs boson and its eventual discovery by Sir. Peter Higgs is an atheist. A few years earlier, William Phillips of the United States won exactly the same Nobel Prize for Physics. He's a Christian. Now, if you think about that, it's fascinating because what divides these men is not their physics. They're both standing at the highest level on Earth as physicists. And yet one is a Christian and the other is an atheist. And what that ought to indicate to us is that the conflict has been misrepresented in our society, seriously and erroneously misrepresented as a conflict between science on the one side and belief in God on the other, when in fact it is a very different conflict. The real conflict is at the worldview level. And if you go back to the ancient Greeks, we can understand that in that time, there were two or three basic attitudes to this universe. There was the atomism of the brilliant thinkers, Democritus and Leucippus, who felt that there were just two things. Reality consisted of atoms in empty space. And atoms cascading through empty space produced the stars, the galaxies, the universe, the world, the planets, life, and so on. There was no transcendence. And they were the fathers of the present-day materialists. But there were then Socrates and Plato and Aristotle, men who believed, yes, the physical universe is real, but there's more to it than that. There is transcendence. There are the gods or there is God. 
And so battling up through history, coming into the 21st century academy, you find there are those two worldviews. There is, of course, pantheism, if you want to include it, but we haven't time to address it tonight. But the conflicting worldviews in society today are, on the one hand, materialism or naturalism. There's a slightly nuanced difference between them. On the one hand, and theism, in my case, Christian theism, on the other hand. And the point I want to make, first and foremost, is there are scientists on both sides. There are people of equal intellectual capacity and integrity on both sides of that divide. So the real question behind has science buried God is where does science really sit in the debate? Is it neutral? Or does it, as Richard Dawkins would suggest, point towards atheism? Or does it, as others would suggest, point towards theism? And so I want to try to address that question on the basis of my own thinking about it and my own interaction, which I've been very privileged to be allowed to do with people of the eminence of Richard Dawkins and, and Peter Hitchens and Peter Singer and many others as well. But the key issue to my mind is this. We're thinking about evidence. Now the motto of the school, which I see is all over the place, Garda Tafla, guard your faith. I'm delighted to see that as a motto for a school in the 21st century. And I suspect that the people that gave you that motto were thinking of the Christian faith. I want to widen it tonight. I want people to be encouraged to guard it ta foi in science. Because what is popularly not realized is that faith is an essential ingredient in science every bit as much as it is in the Christian faith or any other religion. So guard it ta foi is my topic for tonight. But I want to amplify it and perhaps define it a little bit more closely because of the difficulties and confusions arising. But since Isaac Barrow was a student here and taught Isaac Newton, let's look first of all for our evidence from history. Now what I'm going to suggest to you tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we understand that faith in Newton's laws is evidence-based faith. I'm going to suggest to you that faith in God is evidence-based faith. It's not taking a leap in the dark. It's not blind faith. It's as rational as belief in the second law of thermodynamics. The evidence is of different kinds, of course, and we shall go into it. So let me first call history to witness. We're all aware of the explosion of science in the 16th and 17th centuries. Galileo, Newton, Kepler, and then coming up through the whole long list of people. And every one of them, essentially, with nuances in what they actually believed, was a theist, was a believer in God. Now, that is interesting because it's historically there and it demands some sort of response. And the general response these days, and I worked, had the privilege of working with Professor John Hedley Brooke, the first professor of science and religion at Oxford, is to quote C.S. Lewis, who was again summarizing the work of Sir Alfred North Whitehead, men became scientific. Why? Because they expected law and nature. Why? Because they believed in a lawgiver. In other words, one of the fascinating facts, and I believe it is a fact of our history, is that far from faith in God hindering science, it was the motor that drove it, because it carried with it the implication that God was a rationally intelligent being and had created a universe that followed rationally comprehensible laws. And they would therefore be accessible to a being who was made in the image of God as an equally rationally intelligent being. So, the start of science in the 16th and 17th centuries was very much in a theistic base. Now, it's often objected to that, and I understand the objection, but look, everybody believed in God in those days. So what's the big deal? Well, we can test it in the opposite direction. Because Joseph Needham was a famous Oxford chemist 
But more to the point in this, he was a Sinologist, an expert on China. And he wrote the definitive works on the development of history of Chinese technology and science. He was a neo-Marxist. And for years, he tried to understand why it was that China had not developed abstract science, as distinct from printing and fireworks and a lot of technology and engineering, why they never developed an abstract scientific view of the universe. And he tried to fit it into neo-Marxism and failed. And he eventually said, he found that the real difference between the East and the West was that the East lacked the unifying concept of a single creator who'd created the universe to operate on rational law. So that tests it the opposite direction. So it simply is a fact, and let me put it very bluntly, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not remotely ashamed of being a scientist and a Christian, because arguably, Christianity gave me my subject. The odd thing to me is, is how the situation has come to apparently be reversed. And how atheism has come to be regarded as the default worldview in our British society today. So that every other worldview scarcely gets a look in. That's an amazing situation when you look back at history. But I think there are certain reasons for it. It's a very complex question. And I shall just address some of the reasons that I feel are important here. Why the pressure then to choose between God and science? Now, of course, many people feel it's a no contest thing. That you can believe in God if you like, if you assign him a place with uh, the Truth Fairy or Santa Claus, or if you're Irish with leprechauns at the bottom of your garden. I think that's a very simplistic view. After all, ladies and gentlemen, have you ever met an adult who came to believe in Santa Claus? Or who came to believe in the Truth Fairy? Of course not. I've met thousands of adults who've come to believe in God. And to put them in the same category is not to take the matter at all seriously. But it is interesting that the psychological force of Freudianism is still felt very much today. And I get this all the time. God is a delusion. He's clearly a wish fulfillment. You're not strong enough to face the reality of a universe without God. And so you invent some kind of crutch. Well, I accept that argument, provided God doesn't exist. I think Freud showed brilliantly that if God does not exist, then belief in him is a wish fulfillment and a delusion. But as Germany's leading psychiatrist, Manfred Lutz, pointed out recently in a book, A Brief History of the Great One, God, he says, of course, if God does exist, the very same Freudian argument will show you that atheism is the great delusion. As was pointed out by Nobel Prize winner Cheswaf Miwash, a Pole, who knew what he was talking about, when he said atheism is a great opium of the people, the fulfillment of a wish never to have to face God with all the evils that we've committed. And it says the point is that it depends what you assume to start with. And then he puts the knife in and gives us the bottom line. And he says, as to whether God exists or not, which is the key question, Freud, Jung, or Frankel, none of them can help you. Because you've got to decide that on the basis of the evidence. And that was seen rather amusingly to my mind, and the headmaster kindly quoted it, when Stephen Hawking published an article in, I think, the Daily Bear, but I'm not sure, um, saying that religion was a fairy story for people afraid of the dark. And I was asked to comment, and I said, do you want a one-liner? And they said, yes, please. So I said, okay, atheism is a fairy story for people afraid of the light. Well, what does that prove? Absolutely nothing. And it actually indicates, ladies and gentlemen, another of the major problems today. A lot of the argument is carried by assertion, not evidence. Rhetoric, just saying. I mean, I can say what I've just said, but that doesn't give you any evidence for its truth or not. But the difficulty is we live in a world where science has, partly rightly of course, got immense cultural prestige and authority. And what we need to remember is this, and I say this as a passionate scientist, not every statement by a scientist is a statement of science. Not every statement 
by a scientist is a statement of science. And our society has been bamboozled into thinking, amazingly, that science is the only way to truth. Well, if that were the case, Felstead School would have to close a lot of departments. History for a start, sir. And economics, and art, and music, and so on. The idea that science is the only way to truth, which is held by an amazing number of people, is an amazing thing to my mind. And it leads to people beginning to think that science is coextensive with rationality. And that's even more dangerous. So if it's not scientific in the sense of the natural scientists, it's not rational. But that's absurd. That is to relegate, as I mentioned, all history, ethics, politics, art, languages, culture, literature, to the dustbin. It is simply absurd. In fact, I would want to argue that science deals with questions that are less important in a way than the questions dealt with by the great literature of the world. Questions, for example, of meaning, which many scientists claim is not within their province. So it's very important to realize, and I'm sure it's got across to the students at this school, that science, although very important, is not coextensive with rationality. Science is limited, but it is very dangerous, as Sir Peter Medawar pointed out, Nobel Prize winner, uh, a scientist. He said, we do science a disservice if we claim it can answer all questions. Because it's obvious it cannot even answer the simple questions of a child. What's the meaning of my life? Where did I come from? Where am I going to? Who am I? It doesn't answer those questions. We have to go, as he pointed out, to literature, to theology, to the arts, to a much wider world. There is a bigger world of thought, and I noticed that your lectures were dedicated to, and I applaud you for that title. So it seems to me to be very important that we now probe into this. Why is it that science has such authority? Well, one of the reasons has to do with explanation. Science explains. And here is where the problems start. First of all, what does science explain? You've got Newton's law of gravitation. Marvelous. You can do <laughs> mathematics and you can land a person on the moon without even Einstein's corrections. Marvelous stuff. But what escapes often the school and the university system is that Newton's law of gravitation doesn't tell you what gravity is. Nobody knows what gravity is. Even scientific explanation is limited. But it's worse still, because explanation comes at different levels. You've all heard, and I mentioned it to the students this afternoon, the famous question, why is the kettle boiling? Well, it's boiling because the water has reached a certain temperature, enough energy is put into it so that the, the molecules start to go faster and faster and faster. No, it's not. It's because I want a cup of tea. <laughs> Both of those answers are perfectly correct. But please notice, those answers do not compete and they don't conflict. They're complementary. Now, this is what I find astonishing about this whole business. That either science or God, with the impression that God is the same kind of explanation as science. That's like saying Henry Ford, as an explanation for the Ford motor car, is the same kind of explanation as the law of internal combustion. That's sheer nonsense. But what is also sheer nonsense is that the existence of a mechanism or a law which explains something at the scientific level is not in itself an argument against the existence of an agent who designed the whole thing. Wouldn't it be absurd, and I hear many leading scientists arguing it, that we've got a law that does something, therefore there's no God. That is to commit a very naive philosophical category of this day. It's to confuse mechanism and law on the one hand, with agency on the other hand. Once we begin to say that the mechanism law level of explanation is only one level of explanation, it takes a vast amount of the heat out of the topic. 
When Isaac Newton discovered his law of gravitation, he didn't say, well, now I've got a law, I don't need God. No. What he did was write Principia Mathematica, the most famous book in the history of science, expressing the hope that a thinking person, he hoped, would come through it to believe in a deity. Now, do you see what's going on there? It wasn't his lack of understanding that made him worship God more. It was his increase in understanding. And of course, that's the way it works in art, in literature, and in science. The more I read of the mathematics of a genius like Wallace, the more I admire his genius, not the less. The more I study art, the more I can admire and understand Rembrandt. The more I study what he's done, the more I see the genius of his agency of doing it. And the more I study science, the more I worship the God who did it that way. And here we come to one of the biggest problems of all. Ladies and gentlemen, we live in an age where the word God has changed its meaning. And it's changed its meaning at a very high level indeed. And I only hit upon this in the last few years. I wondered why is it this colossal pressure to get people to choose between science and God. And I could see those scientific arguments I've just given to you, the confusion between mechanism and agency and so on. But I thought there must be more to it than that. And, and one day it struck me very powerfully that it's very simple. Many people I meet, like Christopher Hitchens for instance, their concept of God, and this is what they think I believe, is a God of the gaps. Put simply, I can't explain it, therefore God did it. Like the ancient Greek gods, they were afraid of thunder and lightning, so they postulated a God of thunder and lightning. Do atmospheric physics in the physics lab here, you'll soon be dispelled of that, you'll soon get rid of that God, you see. And it's very interesting because I did a debate at Oxford last year, the God debate, they always have one. And the opposition's main argument intrigued me. I'd heard it before, but I didn't expect to hear it at the Oxford Union, I must say. Um, they said, you know, pointing at me, you are an atheist with regard to, and they started with Artemis, Baal, and went through the alphabet rather boringly for a long time, and ended up with Zeus. And I was accused of atheism with respect to all these gods, which I admitted, of course. And then the punchline was, and we just go one god more. We get rid of Jehovah, the God of the Bible. And I thought that's incredible. That shows total ignorance of the gods of the ancient Near East, which happened to be a great interest of mine. Werner <laughs> Jaeger, who was the leading scholar in the world on the topic, made this point. He said, if you look at the gods of the ancient world, by and large, their mythologies out of which they come, they are they have not only cosmologies, they have theogenies. That is the genesis of the gods. The ancient gods were products of the material universe which predated them. That's fascinating. They were material gods. Bernie Jaeger says the god of the Bible created the universe. He wasn't descended from it. And to say we just go one god more show that they feel that the God of the Bible is one of those Greek type gods who disappears on the advance of science. Now think about this logically. If God is defined to be a placeholder for my ignorance, I can't explain that bit, therefore God did it. Of course you have to choose between God and science because that's how you define God. This to my mind is a very important key to the contemporary debate. It's arguing about the wrong God. It is, in a way, unintended by Richard Dawkins, a God delusion. It's the wrong God. It isn't the God of the Bible. And I would stand on their side. As I pointed out to Richard once, in a friendly fashion, the God you don't believe in, I don't believe in either. <laughs> and it seems to me to be very important that in the debate we are aware of what God we are talking about. Apart. So not a God of the gaps, the God of the whole show, the God of the bits we do understand and the God of the bits we don't. Now although I've answered this question this afternoon, it's such a common one, I'm going to mention it again tonight. It's the 
the one I used to meet a lot in Russia, but it's become popular here. And it's the, if you believe that God created the universe, you've got to logically ask who created God? Who made God? Who created the creator that created the creator? And it goes on infinitely backwards. And so it's absurd, and so we give up belief in God. Well, not so quickly. Because you see, the sentence, the statement, the question is fascinating. Philosophers have a name for it. They call it a complex question because it has hidden assumptions. Let me abstract from the question so that you can see that. Who or what created X? What's the assumption in the question? Of course that X was created. That's the assumption, unspoken. So if you ask who created God, you're assuming God was created. But what if he wasn't? As of course all three monotheistic faiths claim. Then your question doesn't apply. So what seems to be a very attractive way out actually bypasses the central issue. And it's very interesting, when I've been faced with this, Peter Singer actually was the most recent publisher who mentioned it. And I pointed out, Peter, you see, it works the other way as well. It does apply to created gods, and you believe the universe created you. Well, tell me, who created your creator? I still wait for answers to those questions. You see, the biblical claim is God is eternal. So if you want to deal with that, of course, which you can, you can deny the existence of the eternal, but that's a different matter altogether. This who created God a thing doesn't have any steam in it at all, actually, from a philosophical perspective, as many people have pointed out. And yet, it's an extremely popular argument. I've been to many schools in the past 10 years, and I think I've got it everywhere. Many universities got it everywhere. And yet, the moment you point out the logic of it, it dissolves completely. So, there's no escape, I think, uh, that way round. Well, now, let's move on a little bit. Because Newton, as I said, and the early scientists believe in a lawgiver. And so we come to this matter of God had tafwa. What is the nature of faith? In Webster's Dictionary, but not the OED, I'm glad to say, yet, there's a new entry. Faith, noun, believing where there's no evidence. That is very interesting, isn't it? <coughs> faith in English comes from the Latin word fides, and it's cognate with the Greek word pistis, and so on. And if you look up the OED, you see words like trust, reliability, and so on and so forth. And I don't think there's a person in this room that doesn't understand what evidence-based faith is as a result of the financial crisis, actually. Why was faith lost in the banking system? And why did the markets freeze until confidence could be built up, until trust could be built up, and to our cost, of course, we've all learned the hard way what evidence-based faith is. I'm amazed that there's been such pressure culturally to redefine faith as a word, to make it first of all a religious concept only. So that people meet me and they say, you're a man of faith, and that's an insult. Because what they mean by that is, I believe when there's no evidence, so I'm a fool. That's blind faith, ladies and gentlemen. And of course it's dangerous and is a delusion. Blind faith is what causes young men to fly planes into tall buildings and create absolute mayhem. And it's very important that we realize, and I speak as a Christian here, other religions have the right and should to speak for themselves. But here I speak as a Christian. I wouldn't stand here for a nanosecond if I didn't believe that my faith in God was evidence-based. There are reasons for it. It's a rationally grounded faith. Now, of course, God is not a theory. He's a person. I have a wife. I've been married to her for 46 years. I have faith in her. It's evidence-based, you know. <laughs> now, when I first got to know her and made up my mind, and it took a long time because I'm a mathematician. <laughs> but in the end, I popped the question. I didn't know everything about her. I, she didn't know everything about me. But I had enough reason to think I can commit myself to this woman. 
Do you see what I mean? You don't know everything, but it's not blind faith. Well, the title's if it's blind faith. It's a commitment based on evidence. Now, taking that analogy forward, a person is more complex than a theory. There are theories about God, but God is not a theory, he's a person. Let me take a supreme example that demonstrates this. One of the major pieces of evidence for the truth of Christianity from this perspective is the fourth gospel, the gospel of John. In it, Christ makes startling claims like, I am the truth. I am the resurrection and the life, and so on. And the interesting thing about that is, towards the end of his book, he says this. Many other signs Jesus did in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written in order that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life in his name. In other words, John's saying, here's the evidence. I've chosen these particular signs, semion in Greek, from which we get semiotics. That is, things that Jesus did that pointed to his true identity. I've written these so that you might believe. In other words, I'm suggesting to you that faith in Christ and God is evidence-based. Otherwise, if it weren't, you'd scrap the Gospel of John because it claims to be evidence. Now that is extremely important because the general culture has got the impression of the exact opposite. That the New Testament documents are not reliable. Few people realize that they're far more authoritative and reliable than the classic texts we read in school by Thucydides and Caesar and so on. Far more reliable. The evidence can be checked and we can approach it in that kind of way. So, Evidence-based faith on the Christian side. Now let me switch to the other side. And that is faith in science. Garda tafwa. Well, what is the essential faith of a scientist? Well, I've mentioned it to you before. Einstein once wrote, I cannot imagine a real scientist without that profound faith. And he used the word faith. What did he mean? Faith in God? No. He meant faith in the rational intelligibility of the universe. Faith that science could be done. Now, of course, as a scientist, that's where I have to start. You wouldn't do science if you didn't believe it could be done. If you didn't believe that the universe was at least in part rationally accessible. Now, this is absolutely fascinating to me. Because now coming to the scientific side, we can ask ourselves the question, what grounds the scientific faith? On what basis? What evidence? Why do I believe science can be done? Where is the rational justification of it? And that brings me to something that's called, and this will surprise some of you, Darwin's doubt. Because Darwin wrote this, With me the horrid doubt always arises whether the convictions of man's mind which has been developed from the mind of the lower animals are of any value or at all trustworthy. Now that is being developed to the nth degree at the moment by one of America's most prominent philosophers. And what he's coming out with has caused an absolute furore. And you'll see it if you Google his name, Thomas Nagel, on the internet. Because Thomas Nagel happens to be not only a prominent atheist, but a man who totally honestly says, I don't want there to be a God. And yet he says this. He says, you know, science has been very successful because we have omitted the mind that's doing the science. Once we bring in the mind that's doing the science, we run into a major problem. And it's this. If the mental is not itself merely physical, it cannot be fully explained by physical science. Now listen to this for a, an explosive statement. Evolutionary naturalism implies that we shouldn't take any of our convictions seriously, including the scientific world picture on which evolutionary naturalism itself depends. That has caused a furore, because it seems to me, and an increasing number of others, that he's dead right. C.S. Lewis said this in the 1940s. Alvin Plantinga, one of the world's leading philosophers, a Christian this time, has been saying exactly the same thing. Let me put it to you very simply. I ask many of my colleagues, where do you get your confidence from? 
What is it you do your science with? And they say, of course, with my mind. What is your mind? Well, my mind is the brain. There's nothing beyond the physics and chemistry. Oh, yes? And what is the brain? Well, it's the end product of a mindless, unguided process, ultimately. And I say, pardon? If you knew, I put it to you, that your computer was the end product, or your iPad was the end product of a mindless, unguided process, would you trust it? Not for a second. And it's that argument put in philosophical clothes that is increasing in weight. Indeed, ladies and gentlemen, it's one of my main reasons for not being an atheist. It's got nothing to do with my Christianity. It's got everything to do with my science. And it is fascinating to watch this develop. Let me put it another way to you. What is at stake here is the worldview that every explanation, we're back to explanation, comes from bottom up, from the simple to the complex. And there have been some marvelous things done in science, reducing, if you turn it upside down, reducing complex phenomena to much more simple phenomena. And some complex phenomena emerge, is the word that's used, although it's a dangerous word for many reasons from simpler phenomena. And so the ideas come about that what we've got eventually is that everything, minds included, can be reduced to physics and chemistry. I would like to suggest that there's one vast exception to that, and that is language. Wherever you get language, you cannot move to the simple, to the complex. You know that, of course. You only have to see a few letters of your name written on a base to know that a mind has been at work. Isn't that true? You don't know whether a machine wrote it or not, or however many automatic processes wrote it or not, but you will deduce that a mind has been at work. And I'll tell you a little story that uh, I've told very often because it illustrates the point. Um, in Oxford at my college we have dinners and you're not allowed to choose where we sit, which has its advantages and sometimes its disadvantages. <laughs> So I found myself sitting beside a very famous um, biochemist and he made the mistake of asking me what I did and I said I'm a pure mathematician and without hesitation he just said how awfully boring. <laughs> um, so I tried to backtrack out of it and it was a bit embarrassing so I said but I'm interested in the big questions of life as well. He said like what? Well, he said like the status of the universe. Is it created or not? Oh dear, he said, it's far worse than I thought. Um, <laughs> I'm an atheist, I'm, 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 I'm a reductionist, and we're going to have a thoroughly miserable dinner. Well, that was a good challenge, wasn't it? <laughs> because he meant it. So I said, well, I said, actually, I'm fascinated by reductionism. He said, are you? I said, yes. I mean, in my work, I take a big problem, split it up into little problems, get insight on the little problems, and hope that they'll show me something about the big problem. He said, I do that too. Well, I said, we can agree on that, can't we? That's called methodological reduction. But he said, that's not what I mean. I said, I know it's not what you mean, but at least we can agree on that. <laughs> and he said, I'm an ontological reductionist. That is, everything will be reduced to physics and chemistry. So I said, why don't we do a, an experiment? He said, what here at the dinner table? I said, sure, this is Oxford. Let's do an experiment. So I picked up the menu and showed it to him, and he read it. Roast chicken. It wasn't very imaginative. It wasn't even in French. So he said, what's the problem? Well, I said, you're a reductionist. Everything in terms of physics and chemistry. He said, yes. Well, I said, have a go at this. Do you see those symbols, those signs? R-O-A-S-T. They're semiotic. They carry meaning. You tell me you're a reductionist. He said, absolutely. So I said, explain to me the semiotics of those signs, which in that concatenation carry meaning, roast, in terms of the physics and chemistry of the paper in England. And there was dead silence, and his wife was beside him. And she very gently, but too loudly, said, get out of that if you can. <laughs> but you know, he was so beautifully honest. He said, you know, John, he was becoming friendly now, um, he said, you know, John, for 40 years I've gone into my lab in Oxford thinking that could be. I was stunned. He said, but it can't. And so I played devil's advocate, which is always quite easy for an Irishman. And I said to him, um, but physics and chemistry have only been going for five or six hundred years. He said, doesn't matter. 
because physics and chemistry cannot even in principle cope with semiotics. So I pushed it. Now you go into a molecular lab, biology lab, and you look at the 3.5 billion letters in the genetic alphabet. They carry meaning. They're codons. They code for the proton. R-O-A-S-T. You immediately infer whatever automatic processes have been involved in printing that menu, you immediately infer mine. How is it you attribute the genetic code to pure chance and necessity. Something odd's going on with this. And I want to conclude by saying this. I want to reformulate my worldview. The first one was the materialistic one. In the beginning were the particles, if you like. And everything else can be explained from the bottom up in terms of mass, energy, the particles, and the void up to and including mind and the idea of God, because of course there isn't a God. The other worldview goes like this. In the beginning was the word. Mind, logos, intelligent creator, primary. All things came to be through him. Mass energy and everything else derivative. And that is where the tension exists between those two views. Is mass energy primary and has produced us without a mind? Or is it that mind is primary and has produced us and mass energy and everything else? See, ladies and gentlemen, it's not only as a Christian but as a scientist. But with the advances in information theory, and that's another topic about which I've written, that my faith is strengthened in the reality of God. And the fact that there's such a close match, scientifically, with these kind of ideas, has another implication. It is John, in his gospel, that starts with those words. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. All things were made by him. I take that seriously. I think it is the statement that makes sense of all my science. And that means that I'm inclined to take very seriously something that comes a little bit later, which is this. The word became human and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. Ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you that science, far from burying God, shows us a little glimpse of his marvellous glory. Thank you very much. Unsatisfactory. <laughs> In the sense that all I can do is give you my initial response to these questions, which I have partially rearranged. There are so many of them, there are 60 or 70 of them. And there's no way that we could take them seriously tonight as they deserve. In fact, many of them I would want to give an entire lecture on to be fair to the festival. <laughs> So you will find this unsatisfactory and you will instantly plumb the depths of my ignorance. But that is what Q&As are. And that's not a bad thing. Because in fact, the people who've asked these questions, even if I don't get to the question, one of the most interesting things to do in life is to <coughs> chew on a question and pursue it and ask others about it and read about it until you get an answer that satisfies you. And on the way, you'll find half a dozen other questions. One of my intellectual heroes is Socrates. He who will succeed, said Aristotle, must ask the right questions. Well, I'm kind of an Aristotle. 
and he was fearfully bright. So I say, he or she who will succeed must ask questions. So thanks for the questions. And it's no insult to you if I don't try. I haven't deliberately avoided any. In fact, I've had to leave all of them, uh, uh, at least half of them, in an order. But the first one was, were you raised as a Christian? And that's a personal biographical thing. And it is important, actually, because yes, I was. <laughs> Um, and I was raised in Northern Ireland, and I'll come back to that in, when I answer the last question, which has to do with religious violence, suffering, and the problem of evil. But the important thing for me to tell you is, yes, I was raised as a Christian. But no, I wasn't raised as a Christian. I had to become a Christian. My parents were Christians. They explained the Christian faith to me, and they were very unusual, because they were not sectarian. My father ran a small business and at great cost, including several bonds, he employed equally across the Protestant and Catholic communities. That was very unusual. The second thing was he allowed me to think, and that was even more unusual. <laughs> so I grew up to understand Christianity to be something that you decided about yourself. And one of the questions rela relates to that. Why do we call Christian uh, children, Christian children, or that, or the other thing, and I agree with the sentiment behind it. Actually, Richard Dawkins pointed this out in his book. I agree with him. It is very important that we teach people. My, my parents lived a vital Christianity in front of me, but they never shoved it down my throat. And my experience of Christianity was intellectually vigorous. It would never have occurred to me that being a Christian cramped your style. At all. I would have been absolutely dumbfounded. They introduced me to all kinds of literature, even the Communist Manifesto, which my father gave me when I was 14, because they thought I ought to read a little bit more widely. So yes, I was raised a Christian, but there's an un unspoken argument comes in. And Peter Singer <laughs> put it in my debate with him. Uh, I told the audience to begin with that <coughs> I, 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 I've been brought up in a Christian family and become a Christian. He said, that's my biggest challenge. <coughs> that's all stuff, you see. People always remain in the religion in which they were brought up. So when I got the chance to speak, I said, Peter, you haven't told us anything about your biography. And it might help us to know, were your parents atheists? He said, yes, they were. So I said, you've remained in the faith in which you were brought up. <laughs> Oh, but he said, it isn't a faith. Oh, I said, Peter, I'm sorry, I thought you believed it. <laughs> <laughs> and that was fascinating. And cyberspace went wild. How is it that one of the world's leading philosophers doesn't realize his atheism as a belief system? And that shows what has happened with this wrong definition of faith I was describing to you before. I believe in God. That's a faith system, and therefore it's inconsequential. But if you don't believe in God and believe in naturalism or materialism, that's not a belief system. And that leads people like Christopher Hitchens, bless him, and I liked him. He says, our beliefs are not a belief. Our faith is not a faith. He got so tied up in the semantics of this redefinition. So the very important thing is, yes, I was raised a Christian. Do you know what that meant? I got to Cambridge last century, in the middle of a long time ago, week one, Stephen says to me, do you believe in God? And he said, oh, I'm sorry, you're Irish. I <laughs> never have asked you that question. All you Irish believe in God and you fight about it. That changed my life. I'd heard the question before. So I decided, okay, I haven't met many agnostics in Ireland. I've met all kinds of atheists, Protestant atheists and Catholic atheists, you know the kind you meet in Ireland. Um, but serious people who'd never gone to church and so on. And so I spent my entire life, ladies and gentlemen, seeking to answer that question. Is my Christian faith true? Not is it helpful or is it useful, but is it true? And one of the ways I've done that is spend my life traveling around the world. At the highest level, I've been privileged to do it. Talking to people, getting to know them as friends, and finding out why they believe what they believe. So yes, I was raised a Christian. But I believe, and I've seen it happen hundreds of times, of course, it's possible to change your worldview and to become a Christian if you weren't one before. I became a Christian <coughs> as a very young person because I knew this was a step you had to take. It's not automatic. It's not produced by some ceremony. 
But I've seen people from many other worldviews become Christians, which then becomes part of the evidence for me that the Christian faith is true. Now the next question is, what can't science explain? Now this is a huge philosophical question, you see, because the pressure out there in the culture is to claim that science can explain everything. But the one thing that I would mention, and there are many of course, and I've mentioned them all, so I may not have made myself clear, some of the greatest scientists in the world have pointed out that science doesn't deal with questions of meaning, doesn't deal with questions of beauty, love, but all the important things in life. It also doesn't deal with ethics. Einstein once famously said, you can speak of the ethical foundations of science, but you cannot speak of the scientific foundations of ethics. But because God has been rejected, and we're the first generation really to live through that um, thing in our culture, there is a desperate scramble to base ethics on science because it has the cultural authority that no other field has. And the result is Europe has lost its moral compass. I would dare to say that. It's a direct consequence of removing the transcendent in our society. And you see the hard atheists, there are many soft atheists in the world. A soft atheist is a person that wants to attain the values ethically of a Western liberal democracy and remain an atheist. Nietzsche would laugh at people like that and say what you don't realize, that his famous madman parable or whatever it was, what you don't realize that if you remove God, you remove all values including human values. And I remember many times in Russia talking to people and them saying to me in the Academy of Sciences, saying, John, we thought we could get rid of God to retain a value for human beings. A hundred million perished because of that mistake. It's serious stuff, ladies and gentlemen, ideas of consequences. And so we need to have, if we lose the transcendent base for our morality, we end up in a sea of relativism and uncertainty. So the children grow up in a world in which they do not know how to steer or navigate. They don't know who they are or what they are. And removing their moorings, and we're still not allowing them to see that there are alternatives to the naturalism in our society is, to my mind, a very bad educational mistake. What can we know about God that isn't cultural or personal? Well, I'm not sure what the uh, questions, uh, what the, the motivation behind that question, because cultural and personal reasons are very powerful and very important. I would say that the fine tuning of the universe, just to take one thing at random, is not a cultural construct. The interesting thing about the atheists, and that's another question that said, has atheism kept Christianity alive? Well, in a sense it has. Um, and in a sense it hasn't. But I am massively indebted um, to the atheists. I remember sitting doing a press conference with Richard Dawkins after our debate, and I think it was the Times reporter said, is there anything on which you agree? And I turned to Richard and I said, I think there is. We both agree that there's truth out there. And it's accessible in part. And he would have said amen if his theology had allowed him. <laughs> he did very graciously. And that's right, because it's very interesting that many of these atheists, we've been told for years that we're in a postmodern relativist generation. Uh, no, we're not, ladies and gentlemen. It is a myth that we've had the pre-modern, the modern, and the postmodern. The ancient Greek skeptics were as postmodern as any contemporary relativist. And the point is, we find all these three attitudes and others existing at the same time, so and in the same person. So a person, very few scientists are postmodern in their science. They might be very postmodern in their ethics. You see. So that uh, reverence for truth is important. So the, uh, the idea, what can we know, God, that isn't cultural or personal? Well, I would want to repeat my lecture and say there are lots of things we can know about God from the, uh, from the scientific perspective, from the history of science, and so on. But it leaves aside the question that I came to towards the end, which would need a lecture. The reason we can know so much about God is that he has taken the initiative in revealing himself. You see, just in the last sentence of my lecture, I cited that explosive statement at the beginning of John's Gospel. 
The Word became human. God became human. And we beheld His glory. In other words, Christianity is carved into history. And history is a massively important discipline. It is a thing that I have become aware of. The rewriting of history is a very dangerous thing, as, as we all know. And to take the history of the New Testament seriously, and I, I just have to cut this short, but if you're interested in how important that is for understanding the nature of God, may I recommend my book, Gunning for God, because it's written exactly about that. I use Hume's criteria. Hume was a great atheist, as you know. He had criteria for the reliability of witnesses. I use his criteria to investigate the documentary, historical, and personal evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, which is the central Christian claim. So what can we know of God? A massive amount, because God has become human, he's entered our history, and we have got then all the evidence that there is in the New Testament. The personal evidence is, of course, massively important. Because in the end, the proof of the pudding is the eating. I can read a thousand books on marriage, be convinced it's wonderful, but I never know what it is until I get married. That's where skepticism goes wrong, ladies and gentlemen. The, the Greek word skeptime means to check out from a distance, and it's very good to check things out from a distance. But you can't get to know a person from a distance. If you're ever going to get to know me, you'll have to give up your distance, and so will I. We get to know each other as people. And so God comes near to us and encourages us to give up our distance. But be careful. We shouldn't give that distance up until we're sure. One step at a time. Examine the evidence. So my conclusion here is there's a great deal. Um, as a scientist, what do you believe to be the mechanism of prayer? I haven't a notion. <laughs> really, I haven't a notion. Ladies and gentlemen, we don't even understand what consciousness is. We don't know what energy is. We don't know what gravity is. I can say something about it, of course. And it's one of the most exciting things. That God is personal and has made us in his image. And one implication of that is we can talk to him. And this is the highest thing in my life. Doing science is wonderful. But you're only studying the work of the great genius. Getting to know him is an altogether bigger thing. And talking to God is what Christians call prayer. What's the mechanism of it? Ladies and gentlemen, it's sometimes good to confess that we don't know. Because it is so deep. I remember once being asked by a, a famous physicist, I just talked to a thousand scientists in a in a group, and one came up and said, now, Dr. Lennox, I see that you're a Christian. He was pretty shocked, you know, he noticed that as a Christian. So he said, come on, this science stuff is wonderful, and oh, he said, I loved it, but come on. You believe that Jesus was God and man, and that you can talk to God. And he said, how do you explain that? So I said, you've asked me a question, can I ask you a much simpler one? He said, yes. So I said, what is consciousness? He said, I don't know. Oh, I said, that's all right. Let me try a simpler one. What is energy? Well, he said, we can measure it. I said, what is it? I don't know. He said, that's very interesting. Do you believe in consciousness? Yes, he said, I do. Do you believe in energy? Yes, he said, I do. I said, you don't know what they are. Should I write you off as a physicist? He said, please don't. <laughs> I said, but you were going to write me off. Because I couldn't explain how God could <clears throat> And that's infinitely deeper. Not knowing is sometimes a mark of intelligence. Actually, if we claim to understand the mechanisms of prayer and so on, they're way beyond us. How does God create anything? How does something come from, well, from nothing physically, but it's created by God? God is the answer to that big question, but I'll come to it in a moment. Um, let's see. There is some over here. I've come to it right now. How amazing. Um, there is something called a quantum vacuum, I understand. I also understand that particles have been found to be created from within such a vacuum. Something comes from nothing. We come from nothing. Can you correct this view? Yes, I can. Um, in the sense that I can say something about it. 
This business about something coming from nothing is a hot topic in the scientific world, and it's very interesting. Uh, the Higgs boson has brought it to prominence, and I was at a, a meeting of 50 scientists that included the people who discovered the Higgs boson in CERN, and they brought a group together, the theologians, physicists, mathematicians, philosophers, and we had a fascinating time. So, this business of something coming from nothing. You see, the fascinating thing is, I have lived to see science change profoundly. In the 50s, 1950s, the common view generally was that the universe had existed forever. And then the evidence began to come in, Arno Penzias, Hubble, and all this kind of stuff that indicated there had been a beginning to space-time. It was resisted massively by British science. The editor of Nature at the time wrote an editorial, I have it at home, where he said, we must not go down this route of it, saying that there was a beginning. Why? Because it would give too much leverage to people who believe the Bible. <coughs> Isn't that fascinating? <laughs> that, um, 50, 60 years ago, a phenomenal resist, uh, advance in science was resisted because it paralleled the Bible. Now, here's the interesting thing. <laughs> I was asked at one of these conferences, how could I possibly have the cheek to suggest the Bible had anything to say about the universe? Well, I said, of course, it's not a textbook of science, but I can't help noticing that it's been saying there was a beginning for thousands of years. And I said rather cheekily, perhaps if some of you had taken it seriously, you'd have looked for evidence of that a bit earlier. You see, you could base a scientific prediction on what the Bible said. So, Generally, cosmology, with some exceptions, believes in the beginning to space-time. So there was nothing before. But how does that happen? How do you get something from nothing? So I find myself constantly now invited to give lectures about nothing. I enjoy it. <laughs> you know, much ado about nothing is the order of the day. Let me just say a word to the question. You see, faced with a problem, of nothing and then a universe, and rejecting the biblical clear answer to it that there wasn't nothing, there was God. He's not a physical entity, of course. God is spirit. And God created the universe. But if you remove God, you've got to get something from nothing, haven't you? So how do you do it? Well, you redefine nothing. That's how you do it. Another matter of semantic redefinition. Now, here is one of the world's top astrophysicists. What would you think, you teachers, if a pupil in this school wrote this to you? Because something is physical, nothing must be physical, especially if it's defined as the absence of something. <coughs> what? <coughs> Nonsense, ladies and gentlemen. And I find that very interesting and very sad. That such is now the extent to which people will go to deny the obvious, that you cannot get something from nothing in the ordinary <coughs> philosophical sense of nothing. That's the absence of anything. And I'm very fortunate that I get invited to do debates with very famous people. And in Harvard and MIT, I spoke at the faculty club to 150 of their professors. And one of them, the man whom I debated at the front, was Alan Guth, the father of the theory of inflation, one of the world's top cosmologists. And I couldn't resist asking him in the question session. I said, Alan, you know, there's a lot of confusion about nothing these days. Can you help us? I want to ask you straight in public, in front of your colleagues, do you believe that the nothing you're talking about in your physics text is the absence of anything? He said, no, it is not. And the author here says a quantum vacuum. That isn't nothing. And if you want a little bit of amusement, read David Albert. He's a very witty, brilliant physicist, philosopher. His review of Lawrence Krauss's book on the, on, on the internet. So it seems to me it's very interesting that here is astrophysics paralleling the Bible. There is a beginning, but creating its own problem. Because if you believed, as they used to believe, and Fred Hoyle believed for a long time, in a continuous steady state universe, you don't have the problem. So astrophysics has created the problem. The Bible is a very simple and very profound answer to it. But if you reject that answer, 
If you're going to be forced into redefining nothing so that the public is completely bamboozled, that seems to me to not be serious science. Stephen Hawking's solution is equally interesting. Because there is a law of gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. That's the heart of his bestseller. That's the main argument. And I read it once and I thought, let me read that again. Because there is a law of gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. Because there is a law of gravity, because there is something, the universe will create itself from nothing. Contradiction number one. Even worse, because there is a law of gravity, not because there is gravity. But what does the law of gravity mean if there's no gravity? And there you hit on a very profound confusion in that some leading scientists, for some reason I don't know, believe that law creates things. I once asked Peter Atkins, I said, Peter, tell me what created the universe. And he said mathematics, and I nearly choked. <laughs> and he said, why are you laughing? I said, Peter, quite honestly, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. I said, let me put it to you simply. One plus one equals two. Did that ever put two pounds in your pocket? Ladies and gentlemen, the financial crisis occurred in part because people thought that mathematics could create money. C.S. Lewis saw it years ago. You can do arithmetic to all eternity, but you can't reduce a part of it. Laws don't create anything. Newton's laws have never moved a billiard ball in the history of the universe. They describe the motion, give you ways of calculating it, but they don't cause the motion. Far less are they created. This is a deep confusion. But it's even worse. The universe will create itself. If I say x creates y, what does that mean? It means I assume x, and that will explain y. If I say x creates x, what does that mean? It means if I've got x, I'll get x. And what does that mean? It means, ladies and gentlemen, quite frankly, that nonsense remains nonsense, even if a high-powered scientist is writing it. <laughs> so that's all about Headmaster. Let's see. How long have we got Headmaster? Uh, when do you want me to stop? One more question. OK. Right, well, that concentrates the matter. <laughs> it's like they told you about to be executed. <laughs> it concentrates the mind, but that's okay. Let's, let's concentrate. One question stands here. It says, what about love? Another question is, what about the relationship between good and evil? No, wait a minute. They're all going to be one question, you see. I'm <laughs> And why do you take the Christian religion and God to be the true one? Because there are other religions answering similar questions. So there are three things, but they actually come together in what's come to have to be a very brief answer. And it's a very legitimate question. I've been talking about evidence for God in the universe. I said relatively usual, except at the end about Christianity. The problem of evil is the hardest problem I face in the hardest problem we face. There are no simplistic answers to it that I know, but there's a way of approaching it. And it seems to me that here is one of the reasons why I am a Christian. Now let me say before I say that, there are two things about religions, not just one. And you know, when we look around the world, the different philosophies and religions, we find something, if we haven't noticed it before, it's quite startling. And that is the commonality of the central <coughs> ethical beliefs. Now, there's no point in starting this discussion unless I regard my fellow human beings, who are Muslim or Hindu or Buddhist or atheist or anything else, if I don't regard them as moral beings equally created in the image of God as I am. In fact, my Christianity demands that of me. Because I'm often asked, do you believe that an atheist can behave ethically? I say, of course I do, and sometimes they put me to shame. Because from where I sit, every man and woman is made in the image of God as a moral being, and therefore as a, as, has got a moral conscience. So I find in my experience that this discussion can only begin if there's a ground of mutual respect, that I'm not impugning their morality. Now, once you've got beyond that, leave Christianity out and you'll find that the major religions disagree with each other massively, don't they? 
Some Hindus believe in millions of gods, Muslims believe in one. There are vast differences, and it's usually only atheists that pretend there aren't really any differences. The people that adhere to these religions don't pretend that, which is why I find they're going to have very good dialogues with them, because they respect what I believe, and I respect what they believe. But the key question is, is it true? Now, how do I approach that question? Well, the way I approach any other question. Let me take a central claim. My Jewish friends believe, I have many of them, believe that Jesus died and did not rise. My Muslim friends, I have many of those too, believe he didn't die. I believe he both died and rose. All three of those cannot be simultaneously true. And you will notice that that has to do with a historical claim. And therefore it can be checked historically. And I would want to say that I would defend my belief um, on the basis of the historical evidence, point number one. But now let's come, let's factor in this other question, because it's the hard question. What do we do with rampant evil, horrific, inexplicable suffering, and the fact that hundreds of thousands of children have gone into eternity without a hope since I started this lecture? What do we do with that? And you know, my heart goes out to the many friends I have that say, John, talk to me about science and God all you like, but please don't talk to me about a God who cares or a God of love. I understand that. And it's very superficial for someone like me, for instance, if you'll forgive me being personal, to say, well, I nearly died three years ago and I was saved by medical intervention in the last few seconds. Praise the Lord for that. But in the same month, my sister lost her 22-year-old daughter just married to a brain tumor. Do I praise the Lord for that? So this is a hard question. It's hard because of these two profound aspects. One is this, that cancer looks very differently to an oncologist as it does to a mother of 32 who's just been told she's three months to live. Watching the suffering and thinking about it is one thing. Being inside the suffering is another thing. And thinking about it. So how can we handle that? Well, many of my friends handle it by saying there isn't a God. <coughs> and you can see them resonating with something like Richard Dawkins' statement. That, you know, there's no good, no evil, no justice. DNA just is and we dance to its music. But does that really work, ladies and gentlemen? because that destroys all morality. And the problem is, here we are with all these moral sensitivities, and we judge this suffering as wrong. Where does that come from? Now, how do I face it? I'm going to try and answer this very briefly indeed. And it's going to be totally inadequate. I tried to write more about it in Gunning for God, because that deals with the moral objections to Christianity, as distinct from the scientific ones. And they are increasing. So, one solution is atheism, but is it a solution? Well, in one sense, it just says this is the way the world is, it's hard luck. For some very few people, statistically, life goes reasonably well. It's then extinguished at death and there's nothing more, but for most people, life is miserable. That's one view. In one sense, although I don't even admit this, but I will for the purpose of tonight, it removes the problem intellectually. But I tell you what else it removes. It removes all hope. All hope. And many of my atheist friends say, look, you still believe in God. How can you possibly do it? And I say to them, look, we can argue philosophically, and I've done it and you've done it. So the kingdom come, what a good God should, might of God is all powerful. All those arguments that David Hume and Epicurus and everybody else throughout history and where do we get? Absolutely nowhere, as far as I can see. So, ladies and gentlemen, I ask a different question, since I can't answer this question. The question I ask is this. Granted that it's like that, that there's pain in the world and suffering, we can see the point of some of it, but relatively little of it. The pain of an athlete or a rugby player. And there's beauty in the world. Coventry Cathedral, you go into it, what do you see? You see a ruin, but you also see traces of beauty, don't you? And as you look at that, you get a mixed picture 
Traces of beauty ruin. And you say Obama said that. I look at the world and I think Obama said it, ladies and gentlemen. Now, here's the hard question number two, but I think we will approach it, and it's this. Granted that life presents us with a mixed picture, barbed wire, rawness, hurt, pain, suffering, <coughs> beauty, love, trust, Is there anywhere evident that there exists a God whom we can trust with him? And now comes the center of Christianity, which makes it unique. Come with me, if you will. You have to understand what it says before you can decide whether it's true or not. You see, ladies and gentlemen, the heart of Christianity is a cross. What's that about? And just try and come with me. It may be difficult for some of you, but try and come with me a moment and just see what's being claimed. If that is God, the coming human, on that cross, what's that signaling? Well, many, many things. But particularly this. It tells me that God has not remained distant from the problem of human suffering, but has himself become part of it. That's number one. Number two is he didn't stay on the cross. And the central preaching of the New Testament apostles from the very beginning, the gospel, the message of tremendous hope was that Jesus, who died on the cross, rose again so that death isn't the end. And why does that give me colossal hope? Because his resurrection, according to the New Testament, declares that he is going to be the moral judge of the entire universe. Utterly fair. And my question, and I leave it with you as I finish, do I think I can trust him? Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.